Hello VC, hello vinyl community. I thought it's about time I made a vinyl tech video for the first time. I have watched these videos in the course of the last two or three years and um, I never participated mostly because uh, just the amount of questions that kind of didn't apply to me at all was just far too big. Now this time um, this actual vinyl tech uh, questionnaire that is uh, being passed around, um, there are still a lot of questions that I probably uh, cannot really answer in good conscience, so um, I will just skip those um, honestly and um, just stick to those uh, 15 or 16 uh, questions that I actually can answer. But uh, this year um, the, the ratio of those questions that kind of apply to myself uh, is certainly a little bit higher than the years before that. Now this 20 point questionnaire was conceived and presented by Tales from the Crate, which is a great uh, VC channel with a lot of interesting videos and uh, if you don't know it already check it out. So um, let's start with my own list here. I have just written this down here on the monitor, I put it on the monitor so I can see it. Um, it's a lot of stuff so uh, I need a little bit of, uh, of a help here. So the first point is a discovery in uh, 2020. Now I just did only two days ago a 2020 video with my top 10 albums of that year so I kind of don't want to repeat myself but uh, let me show you um, two albums that didn't make my top 10 and yet probably deserved it. Both albums have a kind of unique style and its own captivating atmosphere. The first one is a band called Second Vision and this is their album uh, First Steps. Now this is basically John Etheridge on guitar, um, a guitarist from Soft Machine and uh, the violinist Rick Sanders uh, known to some probably from Fairport Convention and um, this is quite a wonderful rather soft spoken jazz fusion album uh, instrumental beautiful music with a lot of kind of electric violin playing and uh, generally really a nice listen and quite an enjoyable pleasant album um, the other record I wanted to show you, well it's not a record, it's a CD in this case, it's uh, an album called Curse of the Pheromones by Startled Insects. Now this is a super interesting band, I don't know much about them, this is all kind of slightly secretive, but uh, this is an album they put out in the late 80s, on the second half of the 80s, um, and uh, kind of the sound is, I mean, imagine Imagine the band Japan and Dead Can Dance uh, producing an album together. So this is kind of how this sounds. Um, and uh, this is highly fascinating. It has a kind of a jazzy uh, vibe to it. At the same time there's a lot of kind of ambient stuff and drony stuff. And uh, it certainly has a degree of uh, 80s synth pop aesthetic to it. So it's a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and, but altogether it's a quite interesting, fascinating album, almost like a soundtrack to a movie that was never made. Um, and um, I listened to it quite a lot during the last year, it's a very interesting album and uh, a little unusual, but at the same time very cinematic and very atmospheric and quite interesting. So uh, that startled insects, um, Curse of the Pheromones. All right, where do you put it? Let's put it here. Next question, a quarantine buy. Now my shopping habits have hardly changed during COVID-19, so I'm sure there were no record store visits last year, but um, I usually hardly ever go into record stores, stores, not because I don't want to, but because I live kind of between a forest and a field. Next question, an LP you want to find in 2021. Well, I never think that much ahead, honestly. What comes along, comes along. So I, I don't have any kind of aim like that. Uh, next question, a box set. Well, the 
only thing in the last month that I, that I bought that kind of have the, the dimensions of a box is this beauty here. Uh, Joe's Garage, uh, the entire project uh, by Frank Zappa. Certainly one of my favorite Zappa albums. Um, slightly controversial, I would say, particularly because uh, this is one of those typical Zappa albums where some people believe to detect a certain degree of misogyny <laughs> being <laughs> expressed in the lyrics. Um, I would disagree, but I can understand where this debate comes from. I would disagree, I would say this is exactly the opposite. It's a quite feminist album in my book, but uh, again, that's probably a debate for another place. And uh, one I'm quite willing to take up, but just not here. A concept album. Yeah, I have no shortage of concept albums in my collection of records. I'm afraid I seem to be somewhat magnetic to concept albums. Um, I mean, the coolest concept album this year, or well, last year, 2020, uh, was, mo was most certainly The Red Planet by Rick Wakeman. Um, this was a kind of unexpe unexpected positive surprise. Uh, pretty cool, kind of old-fashioned instrumental prog rock album um, that uh, deals uh, with uh, certain formations and locations on the planet Mars. And uh, great fun, wonderful record, uh, very enjoyable. Um, cool, tight four-piece uh, musing from one keyboard solo to another. Um, but overall, it's a cool album and certainly one I enjoy listening from time to time. Um, next question. An album where an artist or a band changed direction? Well, I think a good example would be most certainly this one here. Gazeuse by Gong. So this is kind of the moment when uh, Pierre Morlin, the French drummer, took over the band and uh, Gong basically became this... Uh, ultra jazz fusion outfit with Alan Holdsworth on guitar. Um, in America this album was released under the title Expresso. That's where the com confusion comes from because their second album was called internationally Expresso 2, but <laughs> people in Europe were probably wondering where is Expresso 1. Um, but uh, that's this one. Basically wonderful record. Uh, some cool highly complex instrumental tracks, um, but I can pretty much imagine that those that were partial to um, David Allen's kind of psychedelic mayhem um, were probably quite disappointed by that record. So a white label promo is the, the next question. Now, um, in all honesty, that's something I do not care about at all. and. Uh, I'm more like the guy that takes out the record out of the sleeve in the record store and when I look at white labels I think like, oh, they forgot to print the labels, I think. So um, the whole concept always escaped me a little bit, but um, there are a few moments in my life where I actually behaved like a true collector. It's only very few of them. Um, and one of them concerns a musical project called A Small Good Thing. Which honestly is not a band name that is easily remembered. Um, and A Small Good Thing was a project featuring Andrew Hume from OUK Conjugate. And uh, they were making mostly ambient atmospheric music and they were planning to put out a triple album um, that would feature a large portion of their music, uh, kind of compiled together, but it never, never came to fruition. Um, but uh, there's still a whole stock of these printed records um, available on the internet from time to time. Um, so uh, that's one of the rare cases when I have a kind of album that is uh, entirely with uh, white labels. Uh, so because this is not a official release, so it is some of the more rare albums in my collection. So this is a, a small good thing, Slim Westerns, Volume 1 and 2. 
never properly released on vinyl. I think you can get it on CD. Um, a compilation album. Uh, well, just two compilations last year that uh, I pretty much enjoyed. Um, the one of them is the compilation by Faraway Sounds of the Turkish singer Alpay. This is a really lovely record. Um, now Alpay's uh, musical career spans far over 40 years, or rather 50 I think, but uh, this uh, compilation uh, is thankfully focused on uh, the years 1971 to 1976 probably, so uh, a particular chapter in Alpay's uh, career that is that is focused on what you would call uh, Anatolian uh, psychedelic rock. That's really a nice album, an enjoyable collection of songs uh, that uh, Kind of take you back uh, to Istanbul of the early 70s. Now uh, to stay in the Turkey, um, the other compilation that I've really enjoyed last year was uh, Double X by Baba Zula. Uh, this is one of the coolest uh, Turkish bands right now. Um, now Baba Zula is around for almost 20 years. They even existed before that but they were called Zen. So this band plays a quite hypnotic uh, psych rock strongly combined with dub and uh, this is an interesting compilation because uh, well it is a kind of best of uh, record but at the same time almost no track is identical with the version you may find on the original recording so this is a lot of kind of deep cuts and alternative versions and uh, there's even live material previously unreleased so I guess the the job of this compilation is more to showcase uh, kind of the entire oeuvre of uh, of uh, Baba Zula. And uh, so uh, there is all kind of interesting stuff there. And um, this is a really fascinating album that, uh, that you may find interesting. Yeah, Double X by Baba Zula came out on Glitterbeat, the German label. Yeah, I really like records by Glitterbeat. I have a, quite a bunch of them. Um, an album that tells a story. Yeah, hmm. So, um, first when I saw the questionnaire I thought it means an album that has some kind of a story behind it, like Wish You Were Here by Pink Floyd is about Sid Barrett and the music industry. But uh, I looked at some other people making this uh, vinyl tag videos just to realize that uh, this question is more perceived in the sense of an album where you have some kind of a personal story that is connected to the album. Which is a different meaning of the question but uh, as valid I would say. Hmm. No, I'm, I'm not the sharing type, you know. So, um, I could tell you a story. I could tell you a story uh, that I haven't told anyone for 28 years. And uh, it's probably a story that doesn't make me look particularly good. Um, but it's a story related to, a, to an album, to a band. And I guess it's a story that you may find interesting. But uh, actually, up until the very last moment, I was not sure if I really want to do that. But um, maybe I caught your attention now and you are happy now that you haven't switched off the video 20 seconds ago. <laughs> because uh, maybe now something interesting is happening. Well, let me get the particular album in question first. All right. Yeah, so as I said, I haven't told this, I haven't talked with anyone about this for almost 30 years. Um, yeah, let me tell you a story. So, um, first let me show you the album I'm talking about. Uh, let's put this here. The album I'm talking about is called Something is Coming by the British 
underground phenomenon Death in June. So uh, this record here particularly came out in the first half of the 90s and uh, it actually was released uh, in the midst of the Yugoslavian war, the Balkan war. And um, this was a war that kind of fragmented the Balkans. There was war between Serbia and Kosovo and Croatia and Bosnia. And um, Douglas Pierce, the guy behind Death in June, kind of took a pretty clear stance in that situation. And uh, as you can see by the emblem behind him, um, kind of assume the side of the Croatians. And uh, he went actually to Zagreb and recorded there this album. It was kind of like the first, the first musical outfit that uh, came to Croatia in the war. And um, they played a few concerts and then they went to the local radio station. And there they recorded uh, the other part uh, of what's, what you can hear on this album. So this is mostly kind of very melancholic, very misanthropic, uh, very dystopian folk music. Um, yeah, um, now I'm just, to tell you the story, I, I'm trying to set up the stage for the events to unfold. Now, um, me personally, I went out of the 80s quite disappointed as far as mainstream music goes. So. Something about the 80s was really vibrant and fascinating and I was quite happy to be part of it. But honestly, when I was listening to the music that was kind of leading into the 90s and when the 90s finally came, I basically mostly threw up in my mouth all the time. And this may sound a little bit unfair, but honestly, if you, imagine, if you, if you just think for a second about the fact that in hindsight the two biggest acts uh, of the 90s uh, were Guns N' Roses and Nirvana, then uh, this is actually a statement enough about how shabby and how boring <laughs> this whole music industry had become and I was really completely disgruntled with that and for me the only redeeming aspect of the 90s is uh, the ex existence of uh, techno and dubstep and acid jazz and all those things that I started to listen in the late 90s but what I did first when the 90s arrived was to go entirely underground so around around 1990 I stopped listening to any kind of mainstream music for at least six years nothing I only listened to projects and to albums that had been produced in units never bigger than thousand or two thousand uh, uh, pieces and uh, mostly we are talking about tapes that had been released in the amount of 50 or 60 cassettes. So um, I became completely immersed in the underground world and around 1991 I think I started to run a little um, kind of mail order if you want to call it that way but mostly I was like selling tapes and CDs and seven inches basically from the back of the car from the for the car trunk and um, I guess I started the, the mail over the mail order only because I wanted to get my hand on the kind of wholesale catalogs of all these labels and uh, I thought if I sell some of these units on the site it's still my biggest benefit of the whole affair will be that I can buy all this music much cheaper because I can kind of order uh, certain amounts of it and, and just keep always one one uh, unit for myself in my archive. And uh, not long after that I had uh, met Stefan and Stefan was living in Re Regensburg, I was living in Munich. Uh, we were kind of similar in terms of musical taste, although I probably gravitated more towards kind of the uh, dreamy, folky sound while he was certainly much closer to kind of an aggressive industrial music. But um, yeah, the idea was born that we should start a label. And uh, so uh, it was actually me who came up with the name for the label and we called it Ant Zen, which was just an abbreviation of the German word anti-censure, anti-censorship. 
which was maybe a little bit goofy because uh, there wasn't really anybody trying to censor us. Uh, we were kind of these typisch, typical West German kids that tried to pretend like they're constantly being harassed by the authorities, but uh, we kind of weren't. I wouldn't say it took off, uh, but it became kind of a established little thing, little label within this ultra underground community. We started to release tapes first and uh, we always took a lot of time to kind of design the covers and there was always all kind of graphic material added to the box and stuff like that. And um, just one year later we kind of had this idea that to establish ourselves a little more we should definitely uh, start to organize concerts. This actually had a somewhat a reason because we felt like in the south of Germany where we lived there seemed to be a quite a demand for this kind of underground concerts but bands only very rarely came that far south which makes sense because if you are a underground band um, on a tight budget um, you, if you come to Germany you want to play Hamburg you want to play Cologne you want to play Berlin you want to play Amsterdam but to make the big jump to Munich it's you have to cross the entire country and so oftentimes we were left out when these bands were traveling through Europe so we thought yeah, that's the idea. We invite them ourselves and organize everything and that way everybody gets to see these bands. So we, when we started doing that, um, this was uh, just us organizing concerts for our buddies. So at the beginning we had really very small acts, people just we knew personally. The reason why this actually worked was because we had a quite a strong grip on the local gothic scene and um, so we were able to organize a concert where 90 minutes to maybe two hours were reserved for the stage act but after that we did a party and you know those gothics back in the day they wanted to dance so as long as there was a big kind of disco event after that disco I mean with a, all kind of uh, gloomy creepy music of course and one big stroboscope <laughs> doing this for two hours but um yeah, we were quite successful. Even with small bands uh, playing, we kind of assembled 300, 400 people, which uh, wasn't that bad for a entirely underground-oriented event. So we did that for actually exactly 13 months. Now, just a little side note. Um, of course, when we started to make these concerts, we had uh, uh, we have been looking for a location for proper venue that was kind of fitting our needs. On the one hand it couldn't be anything too posh because this was just about kind of dirty music by dirty musicians with dirty instruments and you wouldn't want to rent some expensive high-end uh, concert room for that. So uh, we are looking for the perfect balance. At the same time we didn't want to do it in some kind of garage. So we find a place called Backstage and Backstage was ran by two people whose name were, um, her name was Brigitte and I think his name was Hans-Peter. Now they were really kind of characters that we had a hard time to um, come to terms, but we did it anyway because in those days in Munich the choice of venues was not that big, uh, particularly because uh, kind of the whole rave and techno scene just hit five years later, six years later. Six years later there were just tons of new halls built at the suburbs of Munich and you could just rent whatever you wanted. But um, in those in this one year when we did our concerts um, it was much harder to find a really good place and um, so we kind of accepted uh, all the terms that uh, Hans-Peter and Brigitte had uh, thrown at us and it was kind of interesting because they were these very um, dedicated uh, to leftists that uh, couldn't stop talking about about Antifa and uh, and how they hated everything that's fascist and how uh, this and that. But at the same time, there were this really, really, really horrible ultra capitalist that kept squeezing us out of money all the time. Really awful. I mean, uh, I kept calling them uh, ultra capitalist Marxists. There were these kind of people that were running barefoot in the summer through the city. Do you, you, you know the type probably, kind of with some batik trousers and uh, I, always, I always felt it's awkward when somebody is barefoot in a kind of major capital. 
So I never felt that they were very supportive, but they really liked to cash in the rent. They were really good at that. Yeah, so I hope you are still there. I'm kind of circling around the issue slowly and um, kind of leading you <laughs> to the actual story. So this might have been the underground, but even the underground has somewhat a pyramid-shaped structure. And uh, there are just bands that are kind of your buddies because you see them every other weekend somewhere in a club. And there are those bands that you know, know only from records and you think like, wow, what if we could get those? Wouldn't that be amazing? So for us, kind of the top of the pyramid was uh, to manage to create, to organize a concert with either current 93 Death in June or Sol Invictus. And if we would be able to manage that, just the last step above it, um, kind of the crown jewel of the entire underground world would be to organize a concert for Dead Can Dance. And that's where the pyramid ended because anything above that was just not underground anymore, that was overground. Um, so, um, and that's, that means kind of different, different rules of the game. So, uh, we finally, after having organized like seven or eight concerts, we actually managed to book within one autumn um, Death in June, Sol Invictus, and the Italian band Ordo Equitum Solis, which were really big at that point in time. I mean, this was kind of their year. And um, those concerts were all like three or four weeks apart from each other, in the middle of a really kind of harsh, harsh fall. Uh, it was snowing and it was almost winter. So the first of them was uh, Death in June. I mean, Death in June started as a trio originally. This was Douglas Pierce on guitar and uh, Tony Wakeford on bass guitar and on the drums, Patrick O'Kill. And uh, Tony Wakeford was actually the first one to leave the band, uh, leaving them as a duo to start his own band, Sol Invictus, which we had booked for like four weeks later. And only a few years later, Patrick O'Kill left the band to start Sixth Come. And um, so Death in June at this point was basically Douglas Pierce and whoever he invited to the studio or on tour to play with him. When this whole thing was finally booked and started to appear in the local press, in the kind of concert announcements, um, Hans-Peter and Brigitte started to get all kind of uh, weird telephone calls in their office. And uh, so they went to a record store to finally look up who these uh, Death in June guys are. They were also puzzled by the detail that uh, for the first time we had a pre-sale of tickets and uh, these tickets were selling like crazy. So they finally went to a record store to look up Death in June and uh, this was the album that uh, was uh, kind of fresh out of the press and uh, that they saw. They already gotten themselves into a complete tizzy because of Death in June and kind of yelled at us and um, and uh, proclaimed that this is a right wing band that takes the stance of the of the Croatian Ustasha murder commands and whatever. Um, we kind of really didn't listen to them. This just went in one ear and out the other ear and I was just saying look do you want us to cancel the concert now they were totally greedy so I mean they knew that uh, the kachink is start starting to come in and uh, they they were definitely not willing to cancel the concert they wanted <laughs> they wanted their share but uh, they also wanted to vent kind of their Marxist anger at us and so um, we kind of took it and uh, thought like yeah um, I guess uh, we have uh, just elevated ourselves into a kind of a new new uh, level of the game. And uh, yeah, and then the day came. And it was really bad weather outside, very cold. And uh, we were quite early in the, in the concert hall in the room, setting everything up. And uh, honestly, we were pretty, pretty nervous. Well, I was certainly nervous because... Uh, we kind of knew that uh, Douglas Pierce has a very kind of strong personality and probably can be a bit difficult as an artist. And uh, so 
we were all kind of nervous. And then finally Death in June arrived. And now Douglas was a impressive character and uh, indeed a dominant personality. And um, But uh, what we did not expect is that he brought someone with him and that was Boyd Rice. Now Boyd Rice at this point in time was a artist whose name we prefer to whisper because uh, this was someone that you kind of feared. And uh, if you look at uh, his imagery from the 80s, you quickly understand why. And uh, so it was fascinating. We, like we thought we won the jackpot because, man, Death in June was here, Boyd Rice was here, what else? So this was quite uh, amazing. We showed them the backstage. I mean, they had faxed us some hilarious writers uh, to the contract. So we had bought a lot of alcohol and a lot of uh, interesting food and drinks and whatever. So everybody was kind of happy camper. And then the audience started to arrive. Now, you must understand that this hall was basically built for 400 people. And uh, when we did a concert there, between Stefan and me, we personally knew like 250 of those people. So this was kind of our scene. Those were people that we had seen for years every weekend in the clubs we went to, in the concerts we attended, etc. So it has always been in some ways this kind of a familiar enterprise making these concerts. Uh, I think it was based kind of on the, on the notion that you are doing this for your kind of scene and much less for a commercial reason which indeed was the case because we never made any money from these concerts. Um, this went all in the pockets of Brigitte and Hans-Peter. And um, But this evening, this night, all hell broke loose. I mean, this was mayhem. There were uh, probably 800 people there, which was twice as much as you could kind of put into the, into the hall. So we were disturbed, we were quite nervous how this all will turn out. Uh, we started to feel that we kind of entering a slightly um, semi-legal grounds because uh, this club, this room, this concert room was probably registered for a certain amount of people and I think we were far over it. Um, now, there were things suddenly happening um, that uh, we did not expect. So, uh, in, in one minute I was called to the, to the women's toilets and uh, there was just this girl and uh, they were all telling me that she attempted to commit suicide. Um, now, the problem is I was 22 years old. I had no any kind of qualification to deal with things like that. So, um, I was really an asshole to her because I just I was just this whole situation was just exploding in my head and I was just telling her you know what if you want to do it just do it but please don't do it here because we have so much to do and just do it outside and um, so probably not uh, the best way but uh, at the same time I was deeply convinced that she's just well just acting and um, the same evening we had been uh, given the intel that there will be um, undercover police in the audience. Um, a lot of these people that came really suddenly looked very shady to us. I mean, this was not our scene anymore. This was something entirely different. There was this, there was just this explosiveness in the air. You kind of felt like you need one spark and something is going to happen. And suddenly we had to deal with problems like, do we still let people in or do we kind of turn people away? And um, it was it was a tense situation. Now uh, the problem <laughs> the problem is that we were just naive kids and we were totally clueless about what it meant to invite Death in June. We were just too far inside the scene to see the whole picture. So there was this band that was kind of touring through Europe and dragging this whirlwind of controversy and of uh, conflict and of uh, Antifa people organizing their rallies outside of the hall, trying to kind of cancel the concert and all those things. We just didn't know what hit us. And uh, I mean, just to put it in the context, there is something here in Germany that we call Verfassungsschutz, which is kind of a federal office tasked with the protection of the Grundgesetz of the Constitution, which means they are like an intelligence gathering body 
that uh, is focused on all extremist elements you can imagine, regardless if they are from the left, from the right, if they are religious, if there are, if it's about sects, etc. And um, yeah, Death in June started to appear in their annual reports. Um, nothing fancy though, but um, yeah, this was suddenly this was more an, of an issue than we personally, we two chumps, <laughs> just <laughs> understood at this point. So uh, this all kind of started to look like a giant avalanche <laughs> that was <laughs> really breaking loose above us. And uh, I was sitting in the backstage with uh, Boyd Rice and Douglas Pierce and um, kind of started to talk about the audience and uh, now I don't know why I had to open my mouth instead of shutting up but when you are 22 many times you speak before thinking and um, yeah so I kind of started to talk about the audience outside and how bothered I was with these two guys and uh, it kind of turned into um, pretty sharp argument because I was kind of saying yeah we understand you we understand your music we understand what you're doing in terms of uh, uh, artistic expression and we understand kind of the ideological traps that you are setting for the audience to kind of entertain these impressions and ideas um, and um, their relativistic nature and whatever but not everybody is really understanding that properly i guess and if you look now outside in the audience and the mayhem that's going on there uh, i think uh, there are just a lot of people that uh, would probably need a bit of a guidebook to your music just to just to get their heads straight and they really really freaked out <laughs> these two guys so um they really didn't agree with me and thought that this is just a completely stupid argument and they are, that I'm just basically throwing feces at their audience. And I was like, no, no, it's just, I, those are just kind of uh, uh, bad apples and blah, blah. And they were just, I mean, I just remember myself sitting there on this chair and uh, just kind of boiled rice <laughs> leaning over me, just screaming at me, you are judging books by their cover and you are wrong. You are the one with the problem here. And um, I, mean, I was this 22 year old kid <laughs> that knew nothing. And these two underground luminaries were just pounding at me verbally. And uh, at one point, uh, their tour manager just came in and just passed me by, and he was totally upset with me. He was like, "What the fuck are you doing? Shut the fuck up, man! Can't you, don't, 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 don't provoke them." <laughs> but I mean, the damage was done. And then a minute later, my buddy Bill came in, and Bill was a good friend of ours. And I mean, he was just walking in and out the backstage area whenever he wanted, and um, he was. Uh, good friend he was actually from new york from brooklyn and but he lived in munich and still lives there and uh, i remember he just s sat down and listened to this argument for like three four minutes and then he kind of raised his voice and said yeah you know what i'm with alice here on this and you know why because you can make your concert here but then you move on to the next city and we have to live with this scum here and <laughs> this was like pouring gasoline <laughs> into a fire so uh, this was a hilarious horrible situation <coughs> uh, where I was actually pretty depressed about the whole situation for a long time. Well, not really depressed, but I was kind of saddened because I started this stupid argument and part of me always regretted this. Part of me wanted for years and decades to sit down and write a lengthy letter to Douglas Pierce just to express my regrets. Not because I was wrong, but because it's a pretty shitty thing to upset an artist 20 minutes before he has to go on stage. So um, not cool and not professional. And it bothered me for years, my weird uh, traumatizing uh, death in June story. I mean, the concert went by fine and everything was okay, more or less. And um, But uh, I was really, I was really slightly traumatized by... Uh, my encounter with Boyd Rice and Douglas Pierce, <laughs> but interesting uh, like five weeks later we had Sol Invictus uh, Performing uh, this was already the start of December as far as I remember and it was snow outside and uh, uh, Again, I was sitting in the same backstage room with Tony Wakeford who is a very different character from Douglas Pierce very different personality um, and um, 
um, yeah, they know each other very well because they were part of the same band at the beginning. They started Death in June together and even on the later uh, Death in June albums, Tony Wakeford kept appearing. And um, I kind of told him my story and uh, kind of slightly heartbroken and he was very amused and chuckling a little bit and he said, yeah, but what do you expect? It's Douglas. He's a poor misunderstood artist and uh, believe me, he he tours into the next city and something like that happens again. It's it's not as bad as you think. So um, this kind of um, I guess redeemed me slightly in the whole situation. But um, yeah, that was my Death in June story. It was a little glimpse of uh, the underground era of uh, the early 90s. And uh, I don't know if you found this in any way interesting but uh, but I guess the interesting part is that I have not talked about this with anyone for well I guess 28 years and now you've heard it so we're in the middle of a questionnaire holy cow so um, the next question was uh, an album that needs a vinyl pressing um, yeah, actually two records do exist only on CD and would kind of make a cool vinyl record and would probably sell pretty well. One of them is uh, the, the album Traditional Music of Amygdala by the Hungarian uh, artist Laszlo Hortobágyi. This came out at the beginning of the 90s, around 1991, 92, I think. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, this is quite an amazing uh, exploration of Middle Eastern and Indian music, but uh, through a kind of electronic futuristic lens so um, it's really a fascinating instrumental album uh, full of uh, kind of bold ideas and it certainly would make a great double album and uh, the other one that does not to my surprise that does not exist on vinyl is uh, Gedida by Natasha Atlas so this is a cool Natasha Atlas uh, album I think it was her third or fourth album but it was released in the late 90s so it kind of came into this period of time when uh, the labels kind of stopped pressing records and it got never released as a vinyl record but one day i guess um yeah next uh, next question is a common album and an uncommon album it's kind of like uh, two weird bedfellows in my hand so let's usually let's show one common album which would be clues by robert palmer um yeah, I really like Robert Palmer. It's kind of an unlikely passion of mine because uh, I usually do not spend much time with this kind of a mainstream uh, rock genre, but uh, Robert Palmer is pretty interesting. So um, I like his records and I have a whole bunch of them. Now I have to pick something that's extremely uncommon to kind of create a counterweight. And uh, I have actually three albums here, but they are all on tape. So uh, I thought I will just, uh, in the spirit of uh, my underground story, I will just pick something from those days. So first uh, there is the album uh, Soundtrack to Black Leather Bondage by Master Slave Relationship, which was back in the day the band of Debbie Jaffe. And um, it's kind of a atmospheric, uh, industrial, experimental music, obviously uh, thematically dealing uh, with uh, BDSM. Now this here is uh, <clears throat> actually quite a legendary tape. This is Five Minutes After I Die by the American uh, industrial band Black House. It is quite a fascinating tape to be honest. Very unique, very weird, very strange but uh, also quite cool. And finally, something that's more in the realm of dark ambient and experimental music. It's uh, the album Natura Perturbata by the Heisenberg Experiment. Um, that uh, was actually one of those bands that we had featured during our concert series. And uh, it's a good example of sort of a interesting tape packaging. Yeah, next... Uh, um, an EP. Yeah, I kind of like EPs. I think my favorite EPs of the last month was most definitely um, the EP by Coco Rocco, uh, which is a Afrobeat project, uh, mostly 
around three or four female artists that kind of make the brass section of this band. But um, it's a great, great, great Afrobeat jazz funk, particularly because it had Mutale Chashi on bass, uh, which I think is kind of one of the great contemporary new bass players on the scene. So uh, if you don't know this one and you kind of like uh, jazz fusion, jazz funk or Afrobeat, uh, check this one out. It's called Kokoroko. Pretty cool, pretty cool stuff. Um, and uh, a girl group. Yeah, I don't have that many... I don't have much music that could be described as girl group, but I can show you something with a certain touch of nostalgia. Again, going back to MCs, to tapes, this is the official release by The Runaways Waiting for the Night. Kind of leg legendary band from the 70s. Uh, Joan Jett, Lita Ford, uh, Kim Fowley. Yeah, I mean, unless you kind of start to dig deeper into the band's history and then you are kind of only um, disgusted by all the misogyny that uh, surrounded uh, female musicians in those years. Um, yeah, um, by the way, I have a CD here by the Japanese punk rock band Shonen Knife. So uh, this is certainly a good example of a girl group. And this probably already exhausts my possibilities here. An album cover I love. Now, not long ago, I've actually decided that this is my favorite cover for now of all albums I know. This is White Shadows in the South Seas by Mike Cooper. And uh, this album was originally released on CD first with a different cover that I didn't care that much for. But uh, this here, um, the, the, the vinyl cover, they chose this wonderful wood cutting. And I think this is probably the most beautiful cover I've ever seen. I mean, it has a great atmosphere and it's probably something uh, they found in a museum maybe. I don't know, I'm just quite enchanted by it and uh, quite mesmerized and certainly something when I find the time and I feel like it, it's certainly something I would probably try to get photographed properly and uh, kind of make a giant poster out of it. Why not? I love the atmosphere of this cover. Yeah, this was released on a label called Sacred Summits. The double album. Very atmospheric, uh, very kind of experimental, very in a vibe of fourth world, fourth world music. Um, an album that you've listened to the most? Well, I don't know exactly. I don't know exactly, but I have three albums here that I, that are certainly all uh, big contenders here for being albums that I've listened to most. And um, the elegant thing about it is that they are all from the same band. Oyukai Conjugate. Now this is Seen in Mirage, one of their very early albums. The other one is Peyote. And finally, Into Dark Water. It's probably more like that way around. <laughs> yeah, now I, I possessed these uh, albums in this in a CD form in the 90s so that's how I listened to them um, those are rather contemporary re-releases uh, that came out in the course of the last two years um, but um, this is a wonderful ambient slash fourth world project that has accompanied me for quite a long time and this is the kind of music that uh, is very atmospheric and very original and very fascinating and has the quality of uh, not becoming overused in your mind, you know what I mean? Because, uh, I mean, repetition usually kind of breeds contempt, but uh, you're always glad if you find a piece of music that uh, doesn't suffer from repetition that much. So I was able to listen to those, to the, to those three albums for years and decades and uh, still managed to enjoy them. Now, an album you had to get an original copy of. Now, personally, I do not care about OGs at all. Actually, I will always prefer a repress, a reissue, 
provided it's in a good quality. I mean, the Dorothy Ashby represses are really a joke, to be honest, uh, but uh, m most of the time it's okay. There was one case where I definitely knew I will go for the original pressing, just because I have to, just this was a matter of principle, and that's uh, Thick as a Brick by Jethro Tull. I mean, from the late 70s on, this was an album only re-released in this kind of a gatefold sleeve that was just a simplification of the original sleeve design, which is this complicated 16-page uh, newspaper. So obviously I had to have that. But it's kind of the only time I uh, went uh, for a original album, but uh, it was not that difficult to get. Um, the last album you purchased, the last album I have purchased not that long ago was the album Zan by Liras. Liras is a singer from Israel and uh, this is a quite a thought-provoking album because this entire album is in the style of Iranian pop music. It is sung in Farsi and uh, hence uh, the entire production is a giant controversy in itself and something that for some people actually should not exist, that an artist from Israel is making kind of Iranian album. But uh, here it is. Um, this is actually a very popular actress and singer in Israel. And um, of course, I cannot ignore the fact that uh, this album is even more frowned upon in Iran itself. It includes some uh, more or less anonymous uh, contribution by Iranian musicians on this record, but they had to remain anonymous. Um, so, but still, it's quite a bold artistic statement and um, certainly a an important album um, showcasing that a musician can uh, build all kind of bridges that some assholes in three thousand dollar suits just cannot. Obviously. So, um, yeah, so that's uh, Zan by Liraz. Um, an album they don't get. Yeah, that's the story of my life because uh, I will not get tired of showing this album because almost nobody seems to get it. And uh, I certainly hope that time will tell, but uh, who knows how long it's gonna take. So I'm talking about Under Wraps by Jethro Tull, which I regard as uh, probably their best album. It's an incredible masterpiece of a quite unique sounding electronic uh, power music. And uh, it's uh, in many sense uh, one of the most fascinating music they have ever produced. And at the same time, that's the one album that everybody is shitting on. So yeah, fuck you. This is just a masterpiece and I completely stand by this record. I mean, if you if you cannot grok Under Wraps by Jethro Tull, then you still haven't sufficiently grokked Jethro Tull. I'm sorry to tell you that. So, and finally, a punk album or the closest thing you have to it. Now, this is a punk-free household, uh, I'm afraid to tell you. But I have one uh, exception here. And that is uh, the album Take Me to Sekiri by the Japanese punk girl group Sekiri. And uh, I think that's the only piece of punk music I have in this house. Um, I really don't care about punk. In no permutation and in no context. So, finally, favorite 2020 reissue. Now, I've looked and looked and I just realized that I probably bought no reissue in 2020 that was released in 2020. I bought, I bought a whole bunch of reissues last year, but they were all kind of released in 2019 and 2018. Um, so, I would show you the two of them that uh, really uh, I've enjoyed most. Um, first of all, that's Alchemy, an Index of Possibilities by David Sylvian, re-released on Virgin. So this is uh, David Sylvian's uh, ambient fourth world music album from the 80s. Um, it has John Hassel playing on it and Ryuichi Sakamoto. There is Steven Jansen on drums and Percy Jones on bass from Brand X. 
It's a super atmospheric, uh, fascinating album. Holger Chukai from Cannes is playing here, so this is a great record. And uh, the, the sound is really fascinating and uh, totally hypnotic, and I really enjoy this. This is a great example of sort of fourth world ambient music, and um, it's quite fascinating how David Sylvian was, how easily he was capable of kind of shedding off any kind of pop star artist personality and just becoming this uh, household name of experimental music. Great stuff, amazing album. And uh, in the same spirit, um, just to close it up, uh, at the beginning of the year I had bought this double album, which is Sylvian and Chukai, which uh, had been released as two different albums uh, back in the 80s and uh, this is a re-release on the on the Grönland label. Grönland label is the label by the German pop uh, singer and songwriter Herbert Grönemeyer. And yeah, it's a wonderful, wonderful uh, reissue of these two ambient albums, experimental ambient albums by Holger Chuka and David Sylvian. Um, great stuff and uh, it's a very kind of atmospheric, free flow music. Uh, uh, very textural, very experimental, and uh, again, a kind of an album that uh, you can listen three times in a row without without it becoming boring in any way. Yeah, so that's it. That's my uh, um, Vinyl Tech 2021, and uh, as you probably expect from me, it was somewhat weird. So uh, have a nice day.